Good morning, everyone. It is Tuesday morning. It is time for Ask the Gap Chef. That would be me, Monica Corrado. I am a teaching chef, a certified GAPS practitioner, and the GAP Chef. My website is simply beingwell.com. You're welcome to visit me there. I'm happy you're here. Anyone who's new to this little Facebook Live, uh, welcome, welcome. Um, and you are welcome to ask any questions that you have about the GAPS diet. Again, I'm not a medical doctor, and any statement I say will not have been approved by the FDA. Okay, so welcome to everyone. If you're new, again, welcome to the group. Please do, everyone, do your research, do your reading, read the yellow book. You can see how much I read the yellow book. Look, my yellow book is falling apart. Read the yellow book. Read the blue book. Yeah. Blue book. Yeah. You can read my book. Coupon for that. If you like it, that is the book we use to teach um, all of the certified GAPS practitioners and certified GAPS coaches. So anyway, you have a coupon for that. And please do download... Your, look, I use it so much it's ripped. Download your free intro to the GAPS, uh, pardon me, Gut and Psychology Syndrome GAPS Introduction Diet Chart. That's for you. Do also remember that Dr. Natasha has a fabulous website. It should be the first place you go, gaps.me, and go to her Frequently Asked Questions there are many hundreds of things she has answered specific to GAPS, and you're welcome always to look there. Please do look there. Thank you to all of my friends, students, clients, etc., that are on this page that are so answering fabulous questions or answering questions fabulously. I guess they're both happening. Um, thank you for your help there. All right, let's see who's here. Yahoo! Leonie is here. Yay! Dawn is here. Hello, Dawn. Hello, Gladys. Hello, hello. Hello, Faria. Faria. Faria? Maybe. I hope I got that right. Hello, Natalie. You're welcome. Hello, Dawn. Give my love to Maryland. Oh, okay. Annika. Hello, Annika. Hello, Joanna. Good to have you with us, everyone. Okay. I would love to hear about the photos you post for each of these sessions. Aw, today with some beautiful pottery. Thank you. I actually made those pots. Um, they are actually mugs that I made, I think, six years ago now. Um, I started taking a pottery class, and today I want to talk about tea. And so I couldn't easily find a quick, wonderful picture of ginger and peppermint and uh, chamomile together. So I thought I'd throw my pots up there. So thank you so much. A lot of the photos I take myself, in fact, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the photos that I use, yeah, maybe 90. Some of the book, some of the photos I use are from my book uh, that I had professional photographers take for me, but those mugs are mugs I made with my own hands in the clay. So thanks for asking. Hello from Montana. Hello. Okay, so today I thought I would talk about tea. I know, T-E-A. Tea, you know, cups of tea. I thought I'd talk about them because uh, I don't think anybody else talks about them. And or because they're important and they're important to gaps and uh, they have different functions. And I think it may be that these are some tools that people just skip or uh, miss, they miss in the protocol. Um, Dr. Natasha doesn't spend a lot of time on them, but they are wonderfully important for gaps. And so I thought I'd lead today with the most important one in my estimation, given they're all, all three are important. Um, but in terms of uh, what we're doing here, which uh, in GAPS is digestion, right? We're working on digestion. People have issues with constipation. They have issues with motility. And so for all of that, 
I am uh, bringing up now ginger. Let's talk about ginger. Ginger tea. So first of all, no matter what tea, which of these three you're working with or any other tea, and I could talk about that later, you want to make sure that it is organic. Um, what are we always doing? We're looking for the cleanest ingredients possible. Why? Because we don't want toxins going into our bodies. Uh, because our digestive system is already creating a river of toxins that uh, are flowing to, the river is flowing to our brains, the toxins are flowing to our brains. So whatever we eat, we really want to, um, whatever we're taking into our body, we want to make sure it's as clean as possible. So if that's organic, excellent. If it's wild crafted, excellent. If you know that where you're wild crafting, that means you're going out into the wild and finding herbs and things for tea. As long as you know that it's not a place that's been sprayed with glyphosate ah, or anything else. So organic is what we use to protect against glyphosate and against other toxins from pesticides, herbicides, chemical fungicides, things like that. So organic tea. The other reason I'm bringing that up is because I'm seeing a lot of data right now that tea that people buy in the store that is not organic has uh, a lot of arsenic in it. We don't want that in our bodies. So we're talking about tea. We're talking about organic tea, clean tea. Okay, so get the best quality you can find. When we're talking about ginger, believe it or not, folks, it is cheap 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 and i'm not a bird it is inexpensive to get a ginger root that means to purchase a piece of ginger root from the store um, it is inexpensive and it's really potent and as always we're trying to use things that are closest to nature right so when you're looking at ginger for a tea a root versus a tea bag, the root is going to give you far more bang for your buck. It will be cheaper uh, or less expensive, and it will be far more potent, which means it will be far more effective for you and your body than a tea bag. So I'm not dissing tea bags. We know there are a lot of beautiful organic ginger teas out there. But again, uh, buying a root of ginger, uh, organic root, and using it for your tea will be far less expensive and far more potent. And it's going to be easy peasy when I tell you how to do it. So I really uh, encourage you to just get the root and um, wash it off. Um, if it's a young root, which means it hasn't been sitting around a bin for a while, You'll be able to scratch the um, skin off with just your nail, and then you don't have to peel it. No peeling necessary. I encourage people to boil your water in your teapot or in a sauce pot on your, on your stove. Great. Take about an inch of ginger. Ah, I'll talk about more, more about that in a moment. Take about an inch of ginger and get yourself a very fine grater. Um, I know that there are a bunch called microplanes, micro, M-I-C-R-O, plane, P-L-N-E, P-L-A-N-E, sorry. Microplanes are very, very uh, fine um, uh, graters. So you can grate about an inch of this beautiful ginger root into the bottom of your mug, right? Eight ounce mug. You might want to measure your mugs because most are 12 or 16 or 20 these days. Talk about a cup of a cup is eight ounces. Let's see, a cup is eight ounces and about 200 ml. How do you like that? I'm reading my jar here. Am I right? A little more than 200 ml. Anyway, so you boil the water, you grate the ginger into your teacup, and you pour the boiling water over it. You put a nice uh, little um, uh, let's see, little plate over that. And let it steep for three to five minutes. You can strain it at that point 
and then you can drink it. You can strain it at that point and you can add some raw honey if you like. Okay, hello Jennifer, hello Nicole, and hello Jody for hello everyone. Okay, so here's the thing I want to talk about with ginger. Um, you get to control the strength of the tea by the amount, the size of the root that you grate into your teacup, and by how fine you grate it. So let's talk about that for a moment. So ginger is a root, as I've said. The strength of that, the potency, the intensity of the spiciness of the ginger can be controlled by two things, three things, sorry. One, how much ginger are you putting in the cup? Two, do you cut that ginger into coins, like little coins? Do you mince it, that's smaller than a coin? Or do you grate it, which is even smaller than mincing? So. That's again a scale. If you use coins of ginger, it will be less potent, less fiery, less intent, intense than something that's minced. And something that's grated will be even more fiery than something that's minced. Does that make sense? So you've got this idea. So that's the second. So one, how much you put in the cup. Two, how fine are you grating it or chopping it or slicing it? And three, how long do you steep? Those are three, um, three factors that you can play with, that you can modulate, that you can work with, that you can change up depending on how you and your body work with ginger. So just to be clear, why do we love ginger? It's tasty, but also uh, you know by its fire, right? Ginger is what we call a fiery herb right? It's spicy. There's no, there's no heat in it, but it's spicy. So it, what does it do? It stokes your digestive fire. It gets you to be able to digest your food. It moves the food along in the digestive tract. One of the biggest gifts of ginger is motility. Meaning, again, I'm not a doctor, but ginger is something called a pro- or known as a prokinetic. And prokinetic, pro means yes or, right, pro, uh, affirming, um, yes, going for, or whatever, kinetic, movement. So ginger is a prokinetic. I will always, you've seen me, type on our Facebook page. Someone says, I'm constipated. I say, are you drinking your ginger tea every day? The answer is usually no. The answer is, what do you mean ginger tea? Or I don't like tea, or I'm not drinking tea, or I didn't know it was part of the diet, or whatever. But ginger tea is a very, very strong, um, important part of the GAPS diet. Um, everyone on GAPS should be drinking two to three cups a day. Those are eight ounce cups. Um, it should be homemade. Why? For all the reasons I just said, it, it's very inexpensive, it's very easy to do, and it's very, very potent. So you can modulate, you can, you have your hand on the dial, right? You can make it stronger or less strong, right? Stronger or less strong, uh, depending on those three factors, right? How much ginger did you use? How finely did you cut it or grate it, right? And how long did you let it steep? So, Ginger, again, if you're having issues with digestion and if you're having issues with constipation, if you're having, you have slow, <clears throat> slow bowel movements, um, slow transit time, all those things. Ginger is your friend and it is part of GAPS and it should be drunk every day. You can make for your children, you can make them beautiful little, um, Make them their tea, make them their ginger tea. Let them sit at the table and drink their tea. Make a little tea time. Every day we drink our tea. You can put it in sippy cups. You can put it in mugs. You can get a little tea set for your kids if you want to make it fun and wonderful. But make sure you're drinking it. Yeah, and you're drinking it nice and warm. Remember warmth gets things moving. Yeah, warmth 
helps things to move and ginger is what we call a pro kinetic so i really encourage you to be having your ginger tea three times a day at least two made yourself from a root and uh yeah really a good idea so it stimulates digestion it stimulates movement ginger tea all right so la 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 let's see who else is here i want to say hello i didn't say hello to you yet i'm saying hello to otilia hello otilia thank you so much for the probiotics excellent they are working with the tincture from excellent i'm very happy to hear hello hamda hello lucia lucia i think it's lucia hello everyone all right so ginger buy it make it drink it really important everybody um yeah okay you're on gaps you're drinking ginger tea all right let's talk about um chamomile tea there are three teas i said i'd go over so ginger is the first one and uh really wonderful it's warming it's a prokinetic it helps with digestion it also helps if you have it like if you're a little bit nauseous it also helps if you've got a little bit of nausea going on because you're having a little bit more fat than usual or maybe you're having a little bit of die off ginger tea very soothing wonderful for you to have okay um, let's see what else. Let me see what else is happening. All right. So now let's talk about chamomile. Chamomile tea. So beautiful. Chamomile is a nervine. Chamomile is calming. Chamomile helps you calm down. Calming. Wonderful to have some chamomile tea. If you're anxious, if you're worried, or if your muscle, if you're tight, chamomile tea, nervine. Nervine means it helps the nervous system. Loosely, that's what it means. Again, I'm not a nervalist, but nervine, calming chamomile. Chamomile, wonderful thing to do. Chamomile. What else is chamomile? Chamomile is also an analgesic, meaning a painkiller. Don't take that too strongly. But you're having little aches and pains, chamomile. Just think soothing. You think ginger, you think fire. Spicy, movement. You think chamomile, you think calming. Right? You think calming. You have pain, you think calming. You need to go to sleep, you think calming. It's also a bitter, which means that it can help stimulate digestion, believe it or not. So chamomile, again, if you're going to purchase it, most people do. Some people grow it in their yards. It's very pretty and easy to grow. Um, you can grow it in your yard. You can make a little cup of chamomile. If not, buying it in bulk, organic bulk, great idea. Very inexpensive to buy. Get yourself a little tea ball, and all you have to do is steep it, right? Chamomile. Just think chamomile calming yeah ginger spicy fiery movement okay and then we've got peppermint 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 does wonderful things peppermint is actually something it's an herb that we use to wake up meaning for those people that are having issues because they've given up coffee or they've given up black tea or they've given up green tea. All of those things are not on the GAPS diet, right? And you want a stimulant, right? You want to you want to wake up. Peppermint is a wonderful tea to replace those things with. Peppermint. Peppermint also has a cooling action on the digestive system. Very cooling. My understanding is that peppermint is an anti-inflammatory. I'm going to look at that. I'm wrong. It's not an anti-inflammatory. I'm looking at a great book. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. But it is uh, it is actually antimicrobial, antispasmodic, cooling. Some people do better with 
uh, ginger than they do with peppermint. Other people do better with peppermint than they do with ginger in general. So just watch your body, listen to your body. But again, ginger tea is one of those things that we really recommend Dr. Natasha does in, in her yellow and blue books to help with digestion. Chamomile, calming. Peppermint, both, both awakening, if you will, focusing, if you will, peppermint. Yeah, and cooling, if you will. Cooling. Peppermint. All right. Again, you can grow mint like crazy. Peppermint, spearmint. There's all sorts of mints. Lemon balm itself is another nervine. It grows like mint. It's in the mint family. They are all um, very easy to grow. They grow like weeds. No disrespect to weeds, but they grow very quickly and they take over places. So if you want to grow peppermint, I really suggest that you grow it in a pot. Constrain it. Put it in something where it's not going to take over your backyard. Or if you'd like it to take over your backyard, go for it. Because it will, which would be wonderful. So those are your three teas. I know I spent a lot more time, T-E-A-S. I know I spent a lot more time on ginger than I did on the other two. But you get the idea, I hope. Right? These are all tools. You can use them in gaps. I encourage you to do so. Um, and I really encourage you to not, I'll say it differently. I really encourage you to buy the ginger in the store, make it yourself. Get some bulk herbs, organic, make the tea yourself. You will save money, which we love. It will be a lot cheaper. And, um, and you'll be able to, and it won't, you won't have so much waste. Cardboard boxes, right, of buying uh, tea in a box. And then you've got the bags, and what are the bags made of? And then you've got the strings, and then you've got the paper. Ay, ay, ay. Now, if you're traveling and you want to bring some tea bags with you, that's probably maybe very easy for you to do. Just put some in a little, uh, you know, airtight container, and off you go. Um, that's fine. But if you're home, really, I encourage you to... Uh, Buy these things yourself, make sure they're organic, and go for it. You can buy stainless steel tea balls, make a big pitcher, make a quart of this chamomile or peppermint. You can um, uh, buy the little tea infusers for your mug, for your cup, little stainless steel one. Easy to buy, easy to find, easy to use, etc. All right. I will take questions now, but I do hope, I'd love to see on the page, how many of you are drinking ginger tea two or three times a day? In fact, is anyone on this group? Good question. Because if you are, or if you aren't, it's a very powerful tool for you in the GAPS diet. Okay. La la la, here we go. Let's see what we've got for questions. Yay! Let's see if anybody has questions about this. Hello, Carol Carpinelli. Hello, Umu. Hello, hello, hello. Let's see. I wish I could translate something, something, Spanish moment. Da, 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 da. If you can translate that, Gladys, I would love to know. Does it matter which chamomile, Roman or English? Very good. Um, let's see. Roman chamomile or English chamomile? I don't think so. It's just the drinking chamomile. Oh, I wanted to show you my book. I love this book. Da, da, da. Take a look at this book, everybody. It's by David Hoffman. I love it. I love him. He's a wonderful um, American. I think he's, he's either American or English. I don't know. And anyway, in any case, he is a fabulous herbalist. Um, and he writes really great books. I love this one. It's called The Complete Illustrated Holistic Herbal. Holistic Herbal. And uh, it has pictures of everything in here. The ginger root and the chamomile and every other thing. And it's such a wonderful thing. Talks about how to use it, how to make it, what's an infusion, what's a decoction. All those wonderful things. I'm going to see if I can answer that question about chamomile for one minute. Chamomile, donde esta? 
Yeah, this just says, uh, it says both garden chamomile and German chamomile. Chamomile can be used. Excellent, gentle sedative. Oh, safe for use with children. Wonderful for anxiety and insomnia. Indigestion and inflammation such as gastritis are often eased with chamomile. I don't know, folks. I would get on these things. Okay, let's see. Dawn says, I love making a ginger concentrate time savior and, or saver and savior, and love a little lemon added. Excellent. You can make a ginger concentrate. That means you would take a ginger root and steep it for a long time and then just use, make a, use a little bit per each cup, I think. Dawn's drinking it now. Go Dawn. Okay, Chikawa says, I do and grow my own chamomile and peppermint. Excellent. Leonie says, I add ginger to my juices in the morning. Does that give the same benefits as ginger tea, even though it's not hot? So you put a little clue in there, Leonie, yeah? Even though it's not hot. So heat will always help digestion. So I would just say that the ginger tea, when you drink it and you sip it, it's less concentrated as uh, in your juice, perhaps. And you'll sip it over a longer period of time. And the warmth will combine, the heat of the tea will combine with the ginger to really expand things and get things moving through. I think you should try some, Leonie. Try it as a tea. Okay. Uh, ba -ba 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 I'm looking. Okay, Nicole has something. Hello, Nicole Marie. Hi, Monica. Hello. I'm so thankful for this group. Yay, I'm glad it serves. Okay, I have a quick question. I know it's not tea related. That's okay. The Blue Book says to use sour cream or whey in coffee enema. Z. I ran out of both. Is it okay to use kefir? Uh, absolutely. However, remember, again, everybody, there is a big difference microbially. Uh, and that means in terms of potency, if you will, between cultured cream or cream that you culture with lactobacilli and kefir, kefir, which is uh, a lot of yeast and bacteria. Remembering that kefir will, can, will, can, will, sorry, <laughs> provoke, a uh, better word, initiate. Uh, a strong, it can initiate a very strong, and most of the time does, initiate a strong die-off reaction. So if you're going to use kefir in a, uh, in a coffee enema and you've never done it before, mm, I'd use less and uh, I would check, I would just use less and proceed with caution. I like the word mindfulness. So just everyone, if you've been with me for a while and you've been on the page for a while, you will hear me say often, slow and steady, right? Slow and steady. That means on gaps. Start with a little bit, just a little bit, and, right, continue. A little bit, gradually, more and more. A little bit of anything that you are introducing, especially when you're introducing probiotic foods. That means any of your culture, any and all of the culture dairy, any and all of the ferments, whether they're tonics or beverages or vegetables or whatever they are. Slow and steady, just a little bit. All right, let's see where we're going here. Hope that was helpful. Okie dokie. I'm looking, I'm looking. Tove, I think. Tove? I hope that's right. Welcome. Jody says, I fermented some ginger. Doesn't the steeping it kill the fermenting be benefit? Yes, absolutely it does. But remember, folks, remember, we just, that's a great question. Just remember, what is the purpose? So, so fermentation, fermentation does a couple of things. One of the things it does is to pre-digest the food that you're fermenting. And it also, of course, uh, makes uh, or grows beneficial bacteria or microbes, if you will, beneficial microbes. Um, so 
If your desire is to have the microbes, then don't heat the ginger. If your desire is to have the prokinetic action uh, of a digested, pre-digested ginger, then heat the fermented ginger. So, you know, we just have to kind of keep in mind what's the goal here. I'm going to, uh, an example is um, <clears throat> people will um, soak nuts and then dehydrate them and then bake them, use them for baking. And I say, hmm, if the gift of dehydration is the fact that we um, maintain the enzymes, we don't kill the enzymes, then probably dehydrating nuts before you bake is not the best idea. Dehydrate nuts if you're going to eat them, uh, but not if you're going to destroy them in the oven, you see. So again, I'm happy you fermented ginger. Fabulous. It's probably not the ginger I would use to make ginger tea. I would eat that separately so that you get the fabulous, wonderful, uh, beneficial microbes uh, of that ginger. And then I would use regular ginger for ginger tea. Good question, Jody. Love it. All right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, let's see. Maria, hello, Maria. Carol asks, I have reverse osmosis water system. How can I make sure I get enough minerals and electrolytes? Good question, Carol. So the first thing you want to do is figure out <clears throat> if your reverse osmosis system replaces minerals. Some of them do, some of them don't. So I'd figure that out first. Um, I would suggest, I suggest that uh, two things. One, make sure that you are eating as much salt as you want. And make sure that that salt is a high mineral salt with no flow agents or anti-caking agents. I have some salts listed on my website, simplybeingwell.com. I personally love Baja Gold Salt. I also love uh, the Celtic Gray Salt. Those are very high mineral salts, no anti-caking agents, um, and make sure you're having as much salt as you want, as you're, you know, meaning salt when you're cooking, salt when you're serving, salt when you're eating, salt, salt, salt. Some people say if you wake up uh, with dry mouth, you don't have enough minerals. I don't know if that's true or not, but certainly when I wake up and I'm feeling like I... Uh, with everything else the same, I'll go and have some salt. The other idea is to uh, get yourself a soleil. Either make a soleil from a great big piece of beautiful salt that you can purchase online. You can get it from, try to think about who sells them. Some herbal stores sell them. Or Baja Gold also makes a soleil. S-O-L-E with a little accent over the E where you dissolve minerals into water and then you use that solution to potentize your own water. I did that myself. I have my, my uh, 10 stage filtered water that then I restructure or I structure with an analemma wand from uh, Dr. Tom Cowan's website. And then I add just a few minerals from Baja Gold. Okay. So how can you make sure you get enough minerals? What does lack of minerals look like? Let me think about that. Um, sometimes when you don't have enough minerals, you get a racing heart, tachycardia. Um, sometimes when you're anxious, uh, you need more minerals. If you have a lot of anxiety, Minerals, minerals, minerals. Um, but uh, again, I would make sure that number one, you own some really good salt, two or three different kinds, I always suggest, so that you can decide every day, oh, I feel like that salt, that's high potassium. Oh, I feel like that salt, that's from Baja Gold. Oh, I feel like that salt, right? So to have two or three kinds of salt in the house and let yourself have what you want when you look at them. You'll know which one to have. And then make sure that you're adding some minerals to your water. 
It's a good idea to do. There's also Concentrace Trace Minerals, which you, that's the brand Concentrace, capital T, Concentrace Minerals that you can add to your water. That's another wonderful thing to do. Okay. Hello, Noor. Noor Asma. It's either that or it's Noore. So welcome. Okay, Lini says, last week you mentioned that you need to take butter oil or ghee with cod liver oil. Could I just eat some butter? Yes, absolutely. You could just eat some butter if you're out of ghee. Yes. So again, folks, cod liver oil. Everyone should be taking cod liver oil. It's one of the five supplements Dr. Natasha talks about in both the yellow book and the blue book. Cod liver oil is what we call... Uh, Golly, it's such a wonderful immune support. Has a lot of vitamin A, which is uh, the anti-infective vitamin. Ding, ding, ding. You should, that should be ringing some bells for everybody here. So if you're going to take cod liver oil, you will need to, or you will potentize, you will exponentially increase its usability for the body when you... Uh, take it with high vitamin butter oil or ghee or butter if you don't have either one of those. No problem. Yes, that's just fine. Good idea. Thanks, Lainey, for that. Okay, hello, Kaney. Okay, hello, Hala. Hello, Veronica. Hello, hello. Hello, Kathleen. Hello, Courtney. Hello, hello. Okay, let's see. Courtney asks, what about Redmond salt? Redmond salt is okay. I know that sounds just terrible, isn't it? Doesn't it? Um, but in my, so uh, again, backing up, how do I qualify a high quality salt? More than 50 minerals, no flow or anti-caking agents. So Redmond real salt uh, qualifies. They're just over, I think they have 53 minerals, but if it were me, I'm going to go for ones that are 80 minerals, 110 minerals, right? So we are so mineral depleted. Our soils are mineral depleted. Our food is mineral depleted. We're mineral depleted. Redmond is fine, but make it one of the other three, right? One of three that you have in your house. I wouldn't, I, the word according to Monica, wouldn't, um, wouldn't be using Redmond Real Salt exclusively. Why? Because it's a lot as high mineral as other ones that you could get. I hope that makes sense. Okay, there's nothing wrong or bad about it. It's not a bad salt. It's just, if I know that the Celtic salt, Celtic sea salt from um, Selena naturally has 87 minerals, and I know Redmond has 53 minerals. I am going to go for the one that's got more minerals in it because I know that we are mineral depleted. So that's my, that's the way I think about it. Okay. La la la. Okay, let's see. Dawn says, somewhere I saw someone, I think, ferment garlic on the counter, chopped maybe, and they would just occasionally add some more garlic. So basically they always had a clove ready to go. You can absolutely ferment garlic, um, Dawn. I think it's a great idea. Um, Sally Fallon has uh, a fermented garlic recipe in her Nourishing Traditions cookbook. You could check that out. Um, I love fermented garlic. Hmm. Trying to think. I'm thinking through. Certainly, you would ferment either the whole cloves or have it minced. And you'd have to take the... Uh, obviously the skin off of it. And yeah, that's the way to do that. Okay. Kathleen says, how do you know how many minerals are in your salt? You get on the wet, well, first you get on their bags and a good salt will have the number of minerals it has in it and the percentages. A salt that we're like, I don't know, will have nothing listed. Okay, so if it's not on the bag, go to their website. And every good salt, again, this is just something I've looked at over the last 10 years, maybe longer. Every good salt will um, 
good for our purposes, right? High mineral for our purposes, right? Um, all good salts will list the number of minerals, the minerals themselves, and the percentages of minerals. So if it's not on the bag, look to the website. If it's not on the website, I probably wouldn't use it. There are a lot of salts out there that say that are like, hey, I'm pink Himalayan. So what? What do you got for me? Right? Again, nothing on the packages about how many minerals. So the gray Celtic salt, you go to their website and type it right in. They have their analysis. It's called a mineral analysis of what minerals are in there, how many minerals, and what percentages of minerals. Same thing with Baja Gold. Uh, Redmond has one too. Um, but if I would really not be purchasing a salt that doesn't tell you what minerals are in there because what a waste for you, right? If we're going to eat salt, we want it to have minerals in it. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Dawn put the concentrate minerals in the... Uh, in the comments, thank you, Dawn. The link for that, excellente. Alrighty, alrighty. Hello, Hala. I think I said hello to you already. La la la. We talked about that. We looked at RO. We did ba -ba 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 -ba. ginger, 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 ginger. La 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 la. I'm looking up. I'm scrolling. Okay, let's scroll back down. And see what's there. Okay. Uh, hello, Jane. Good to have you with us. Excellent, excellent. Annika asks, if I make meat stock with oxtail, how long will I simmer this? So, believe it or not, I wrote about oxtail years ago. It's on my website. It's not easy to find because you have to scroll backwards. Um, I have to put a search function on there and soon for all my blogs. But, um, so Dr. Natasha has oxtail soup in here. And uh, I have to say... It was not enough for me. I did do her recipe, um, and I found that a lot of the uh, cartilage was not dissolved. So let's see if she... Um, it must be under recipes. Let me see if I can find it really fast. Sorry. Take a moment. Take a moment. Looking, looking, looking. Keep it away. La, la, la. Fish stock. La, la, la. Meat stocks and soups. What has she got? Meat stock. Soup, soup, soups. Ox tongue. Nope, that's not it. Let's look over here. Meat stock. Oxtail soup. 224 in the blue book. Let's take a look, see what she does. I did this once and it didn't work for me. So. La, 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 la. She's got two and a half pounds of oxtail in two to three liters of water. That's great ratio for meat stock. Two to one, covering the meat. Na, 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 na. Yeah, she says two to three hours. So here's what I do if I'm making meat stock with oxtail. Um, I would certainly go longer than that. I'd go at least four to six hours, maybe eight hours on the stove. You want to get it to where the, the fact that, again, the meat falls off the bone. And with all meat stock, we want the meat to be able to fall off the bone easily. If you see any cartilage that's left... That you may see uh, with that tail try to scrape it off the joints right they have little these little joints in between the ox and the tail right the ox tail um, you can scrape that off and put it back into the soup or the stock for sure good idea all right let's see my meat stock does not always get thick and nice Okay. Um, it depends on what you're using um, for your meat stock. If you're using, if it's chicken or poultry or bird, get some feet, get some heads. Um, if it is, um, if it's anything else, a mammal, if it's, uh, again, cow, bison, donkey, I don't care, goat, etc., you're using wings, you probably should get some heads and some feet. Uh, the other thing you really want to look at is your proportion of water. We remember for meat stock, it's not a huge pot of water with a little bit of meaty bones. It's really just covering those bones by an inch or two inches of water the most. 
right? So watch your water. Make sure you don't have too much water. With wings, you can also cut them in half, expose the joints. That can help. And do make sure, everyone, that you're bringing your meat stock to a boil on the stove, skimming and discarding the scum. Put it back down to a simmer, right, to make sure that it's not cooking really high. You don't want it to be going boil, boil, boil. We're not boiling meat stock. We're simmering it. The top should be nice and calm and the bottom moving, if you will. So either add more. Let's see. The first thing I check is how much water do you have and do you have too much water? So you could reduce your water. The second thing I would suggest is add more uh, connective tissue, right? Connective tissue. Remember, skin, joints, cartilage, feet, heads, right? All those things will help to gel a stock. Okay? I'd start there and let us know how it goes. All right, we talked about that. Okay, any good multivitamin for children that you suggest? No. Sorry. In GAPS, we eat liver and we eat organ meats and we drink, uh, we have good salt and we eat lots of good eggs and that's where we, we eat lots of nutrient-dense foods and uh, that's how we get the vitamins that we need for the most part. Yep. You're welcome. Okay, I hope that's helpful. So we don't really do multivitamins. Dr. Tasha really, um, she really leans, uh, she relies on the diet and getting uh, the best quality food that you can find. And then... Um, cooking it in a way that it's digestible, easily digested, uh, easily absorbed, healing and sealing the gut so that the digestive system works, using some things that you need perhaps to get stomach acid up to make sure that your digestion is working, etc. So it's really nutrient-dense foods, and that will give a child far more than any vitamin would. My kids refused organs. Lots of kids refuse organs. That's okay. Um, uh, a really good idea to for moms uh, to disguise the organs. And that means that um, you can use mostly muscle meat, ground meat, and a little bit of organs in there. Um, you can also make pate from liver and a lot of fat and some good garlic. So just do your best. Sometimes I suggest that uh, moms uh, or dads or whoever's caring for the children um, get some really good quality grass-fed um, liver. Keep it frozen. Get one of those very, very thin graters that I have talked about. I talked about in the beginning about for ginger. And when it's frozen, you just grate it into their soup, into their stock into their stew, etc. You can do that. And uh, sometimes that works. Yeah. But again, you could try some, some people like to make little meatballs, little balls of meat, ground meat. Maybe it's lamb, maybe it's beef, maybe it's beef and lamb or whatever you're using. Folks, if you use pork, fine, put some of that in. If you don't, no problem. Um, and then they add some liver to it. And when you add liver to it, um, it's just a little bit. It's just a little bit of liver, right? Just a little bit of liver because liver is very strong tasting. So start there. Um, also, you could make heart, which is a wonderful thing to make that is just like steak. There's no weird flavor to heart, folks. It's just like eating a steak that's muscle meat and, um, a lot of people have no problem having heart, whether it's chicken heart, beef heart, whatever heart you can get, lamb heart. Um, heart is good. And you can also do tongue because tongue, again, heart and tongue, organ meats, no weird flavor, no odd texture like liver would have. Mia is here. Hello, Mia. You got in. Welcome. 
best way to cook organs in stage one, just boil in water. So we don't boil anything. Remember everybody just this, this is, I don't, I, this may just be, yeah, I get it, but no boiling. We're going to bring things to a boil. We're going to skim and discard the scum over there, throw it out. And then we're going to put it to a simmer. So we're always simmering. We are not boiling. When we boil, we break bonds and we don't get gelatin. I know that's not what we're talking about right now, but best way, fabulous. I thought so, but I thought I'd use that as a teaching point, Mia, for everybody else. So we always simmer. So what's the best way to cook organs? One more time with feeling. So if it's liver, if it's liver of anything, if it's cow, if it's chicken, if it's bison, if it's whatever liver it is, liver is very strong flavor. So often I will suggest one of two things. One, add it to ground meat or, right, add it to ground meat in a proportion of maybe one, one to four, right? One to four, liver to ground meat can make um, meatballs, things like that, and cook them in meat stock. Um, you can also take that uh, frozen liver and grate it onto, into stock right before serving. Stock, soup, stews, casseroles, all those things. Um, if you're using any other organ, heart, kidney. Kidney needs preparation. You need to soak them so they don't taste like urine, quite frankly. Sorry about that, folks, but they are filters of urine. Blech. So you need to soak them first. But once they're soaked, we're talking about uh, for kidneys. You can use kidney, heart, kidneys, tongue. All of those things, uh, those are more muscle, and so they don't have a weird texture. Um, like liver has an odd texture, it's because it's full of blood, right? Um, and so, one moment, I'm still teaching on this. Okay, so, um, so they have a texture that you could cook in stock while you're making meat stock, folks. You could put hearts in while you're making your meat stock. You could chop them up, um, or you could just take them and cook them in meat stock you've already, um, you've already cooked. In terms of soaking kidneys, I would soak them, you either soak them in lemon juice or raw milk or whey. I would take a look at um, Nourishing Traditions Cookbook, Sally Fallon, and Mary Ennig wrote that book, and they have a wonderful treatment of kidneys and other organ meats in there, Mia, if you're interested, and everyone else. So kidneys need to be soaked prior to making, or they won't taste very good. And again, we'll soak them in some acidic medium, whether that's raw milk, if you have extra, because raw milk is expensive um, and hard to come by sometimes, you're welcome. And... Um, or a whey is a wonderful thing, or lemon juice. Those are usually the things that we soak anything in that needs to be soaked in acid. Maybe apple cider vinegar, but I'm not sure that's for kidneys. Okay, let's go back here. Uh, so again, just, just tying that one up with a bow, Mia and everyone else. Stage one, all organs need to be cooked in meat stock. Right? So stage one is all about the meat stock. And one more time with feeling for everyone, stage one is two to five days. That is all. Do not park on stage one. It's too strong a stage, everyone. Okay? Two to five days max. Then you're on to stage two and you're starting to introduce raw egg yolks. Okay. Hello, Carolina or Carolina. Okay, so Jane has a question. What is the purpose of washing and soaking the liver first? Is it okay to cook it without soaking first? So that's a really good question. First of all, the only liver that we wash or soak first is from a mammal. We do not need to wash or soak. Um, it's not even washing, it's soaking and then rinsing really. So um, let's see, only uh, mammals, liver from mammals. So that means cow, bison, lamb, pork, game, venison. What have you got? If it's a mammal, it really, um, 
soaking does two things. Um, one, it removes impurities. And two, it makes it a mild, more mild flavor. Again, if you're interesting, yeah, Mia, there is no stage one for four months. Please move to stage two. Please. Everyone move to stage two if you've been on it more than five days or even five days. Okay. All right. So what is the purpose of washing, soaking the liver first? Um, so again, it's only mammal liver. Poultry liver does not need to be soaked. Uh, that means chicken liver, goose liver, duck liver, turkey liver, whatever you've got that's got wings does not need to have that liver soaked. Um, only mammal liver. And uh, is it okay to cook mammal liver uh, without soaking first? Yes, it's okay to do. Um, it's okay to do that. It is preferred to soak to get rid of impurities and also it is preferred to soak to make it a more mild flavor, if that makes sense. Okay, so again, if anyone's interested, those beautiful recipes about soaking, etc., are in Nourishing Traditions Cookbook, which is Sally Fallon, now Sally Fallon Morell's cookbook with, uh, it's wonderful. Just let me go through, Veronica, I'm with you, give me one sec. So if you're soaking mammal liver, and you're so, you can soak it in either whey, lemon juice, whey, or lemon juice. Those are your two options. Um, I've also soaked in raw milk because I have extra sometimes, which is fine to do. And then you will discard the soaking liquid. You only soak mammal liver. <laughs> I'm going to little tongue tied, tongue tied. Um, you only soak mammal liver for what we call several hours. I would do somewhere between four and seven hours at the most. Lemon will be more aggressive because it's so acid, you know, acid-like, acidic. Um, so a little bit less, or it'll start cooking your liver, cooking the liver, not your liver. It'll start cooking liver, uh, the liver that you're soaking in the pan, right? Something like a ceviche, right? So four to seven hours you soak, discard the liquid, rinse it off with pure water, not tap water, and then cook. All right, next question. Soaking after freezing or before? Usually, um, usually grass-fed liver or liver from grass-fed animals will come to you frozen. So you'll need to defrost it before you can soak it right? If you're just going to grate frozen liver into egg yolk for your baby, if you're going to grate frozen liver into a soup, a stock, a stew, if you're going to grate it in from frozen, don't worry about um, soaking it. Just go from the freezer onto the grater, okay? I also heard, be careful of vitamin A toxicity with liver. Yeah, so Mia says, um, I also heard, be careful of vitamin A. The only, my understanding is that the only time you need to be concerned about vitamin A toxicity is if you're taking it as a pill from a lab, right? As a supplement, vitamin A isolated from everything else. Your body will say, I don't want any more liver. Your child, Mia, will say, your son will say, no more, I don't want it. Do not force it. Your body knows, okay? Maximum liver intake per week, as much as you want. Unless, so there's two things. One, don't take vitamin A isolated as a supplement. Yes, that can be problematic. Number two, right? Number one was that, number two. Okay, it's going out of here now. Mm -mm -mm. Don't, if you have hemochromatosis, if you have a too much iron in your blood and you've been diagnosed, then watch your liver consumption. Watch the consumption of liver. If not, have as much as you want. Your body will self-regulate, right? Usually it's three to four ounces per week. Mm, three to four ounces once or twice a week for adults. But if your body needs it, have it. Trust the body. Okay. Okay, I heard that kidney contains a lot of cadmium. Can you eat once a year? I think that if you love it, Hala, I hope I'm saying it correctly. Um, if, if you love it, eat it. Listen to your body. Listen to your body. If it's clean 
you got it from a good source, you prepared it well, and you want it, listen to the body. If you want to eat kidney, eat it. Again, a lot of information on kidney and organ meats in the Nourishing Tradition Cookbook. I have that listed on my website if you want to find it easily. Simplybeingwell.com under resources. I think I have it there. I hope I have it there. I better have it there. Anyway. Yeah, I don't know about a problem with cadmium. I just don't. I would have kidney as much as you want as long as it's from a clean source. Hello, Debbie. Debbie made it. Uh, what else? D -d 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 good. Hello, Carola. Good to have you with us. Who else? Yeah, Mia. So, uh, again, I think I answered the question about kidneys. Yep, yep, yep. Best way to cook organs. Ba -ba 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 -ba. I think we got it. All right, everybody. We're a couple minutes late, but hello. We're a couple minutes late. We've gone over. I'm going to go ahead and close. I want to thank you all for being with me today. I encourage you to, um, I really encourage you to make ginger tea. Please make ginger tea. Hello, Courtney. You're welcome. Uh, make ginger tea this week. Get yourself a ginger root. Let's see how you do it. Post it on the page. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. <laughs> what did she say? If your body handles organs from your animal source, could you freely give other sourced organs without trialing the babe? I think yes, unless, uh, as long as, remember folks, the first protection, if you will, the first barrier, the first safety is how clean are the organs? Make sure, you know, we are what we eat eats. So make sure they're clean. You source them well, and then depending on uh, if your child's already eating liver from beef or bison, they should be they should be fine with chicken or duck or whatever. But I really, really, uh, you're welcome. I really highly suggest always people who have been with me on this page for the last year now. Uh, I highly suggest you listen to your own intuition. Listen to your gut and slow and steady. If you want to trial that, if you want to trial that, Mia, trial it first, meaning start with just a little bit. It's always a good idea, right? All right, everyone. I wish you a wonderful, wonderful Joanna. Yes, drink that tea. I'm going to go make some. I wish you a wonderful week. I will see you in a week on Tuesday. I'll see you on the page. Please do continue helping each other on that page. Thank you to everyone who chimes in. I have a couple who are always jumping in and helping people out. I appreciate that. Um, for those of you who are new, do please tag me in a post. It helps a lot. Sometimes I won't see a post for two or three days or longer if I haven't been tagged. It's not that I'm not on the page. I just don't even see them. It's very weird. So tag me on the post. Thank you to those of you who are tagging me on the posts. If you see that I've not been tagged, appreciate it. I do try to get on the page at least once a day, sometimes more. And um, I wish you, again, a wonderful week. Blessings to all of you. And thank you for all of the beautiful work that you're doing with your children, for your children, with your spouses, with your partners, with your mates, with your community, right? Food, food, food. Food is the beginning. Food is the foundation. We can have so many things come to balance when we give our beautiful bodies, these incredibly intelligent bodies and cells and microbes, what they need to be well. Okay, see you next week, everyone. Take good care. Bye now.